Like I said at uh, the first gathering, <clears throat> I didn't know that that was the video that was going to play before I started talking. But it's so appropriate because I'm going to be focusing on the Bible. But help me, is it Morgan Freeman? Is that the voice? Yes. Don't you wish you had a voice like, well, the guys anyway. Um, I, I, I listen to him talk or whatever when he's narrating. I'm like, I wish I had a voice like that. But if I had a voice like that, I wouldn't be here probably. Um, the other one is James Earl Jones. Oh, my gosh, I love his voice. And then Max McLean. Have anybody ever heard Max McLean narrate a book or something? Oh, you need to get out more. Yeah, Max McLean. If I had a voice, I wouldn't be here either probably, but be doing what he's doing. Anyway, good morning. My name's Tony Lieb, and I serve our church here as an elder. And uh, I, I am pleased and privileged and humbled and uh, scared to death to be here this morning talking to you. Back at, uh, like Nikki mentioned last week, back when the, we were going over what this series was going to be about or, that, you know, some things to throw into the series um, on Thrive, uh, one of the things that I blurted out was we need to have a personal theology to thrive. And so, lo and behold, that's what Pastor Tim assigned to me. So, that's what we're going to be talking about. If we go back to the, the first message in the series, Tim had a, uh, a diff definition that he used for to thrive, and I want to read that. Uh, it goes like this, to progress toward or realize a goal despite or because of circumstances. Now, when I looked up the definition for thrive in a number of different resources, it had everything to do about the producing something and moving forward and all that, but, but this is the only one that had um, despite or because of circumstances. And I think it's the most realistic, realistic uh, definition that I can come across because there is no thriving without resistance. And I guess the example that I'd like to use is like if you're lifting weights or something. When you're lifting weights, the idea is to lift a weight, get to the point where you lift a weight, even at one time or a couple reps, higher than what you've lifted before. And what your muscles do is they grow. And then they, they grow so that the next time you lift, up that, lift that weight, it's easier. So resistance causes a kind of growth here. And so to thrive is not just about us uh, being productive or being success, successful and all those kinds of things, but it also has to take in the idea that we're going to have resistance. And if we're, if we're really in touch with reality, the truth is there is resistance for, to thrive. So I have a couple examples here uh, I want you to help me with. And, and think of a plant. What, are, what would you say would be the three major things that a plant needs to thrive? Water, sunlight, soil, okay? And we could add to that cultivation, okay? Because I'm using, I guess the context is a good plant because we know there's lots of plants that can thrive without any cultivation. They do it on their own, right? Uh, we call those weeds. Some people think dandelions are weeds. I think they're beautiful when you see a whole bunch of them, but when they go to seed, then they're weeds. So um, plants need soil, water, sunlight, and some cultivation. So how about a person, a human being? Name, uh, throw out some three things that a human being needs to thrive. Water, food, air. Air is the third one I was thinking of, all right? But a person also needs cultivation, okay? Because if we just have water, food, and air, and we're sitting in one place, guess what's going to happen? Not a lot of good things, okay? So we also need cultivation. So in the Bible, there's lots of places where uh, people... Uh, uh, plants are used as a metaphor or like a relationship or, or whatever to people, okay? There's lots of places in the Bible, like Jude, uh, uh, Judges chapter 9, Daniel 4, Revelation 9, just to name a few places. But I want to go to the very first psalm of the Bible, and if you put that on the screen up there, Sean, the first psalm, first two verses. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Now go back to the previous screen, would you, Sean? Thank you. Notice that in the first verse, there's a progression of, of walking to standing to sitting, which is like a negative progression of movement, right? Right? 
Blessed is the one who does not do that with sinners. That is, walk with them and then sit with them. Okay? Next screen, or the, the second part. But contrary to that, the person who doesn't do that is like a tree planted by streams of water, plenty of water and nutrients and things, and then it produces fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. <clears throat> what I want to suggest to you this morning that there's a, in this size group of people, there's a whole spectrum of people and uh, perspectives we come from uh, why we're here. Anything from, no, you didn't want to be here, somebody made you come, to two, you might be curious, and that's why you're here. You might be a new believer, a new follower in Christ, and you're here to start finding out what your life is to be about now. To you've made several, uh, you've made several steps towards a yes to what God wants you to do, and you're growing in your faith. To clear on the other end of the not wanting to be here, and that is of your, you're just growing vibrantly, you're thriving. Okay, so everybody in this room fits in that spectrum somewhere, and I want to suggest to you, assert to you, that wherever you are on that spectrum, God has something for you this morning that He wants you to know. But just like the tree, or or the thriving part, we have a part to play, okay? God wants to cultivate us, and we have to allow him to do that. And some of the cultivating that he wants to do with us, we have to participate in, okay? Does that make sense? So that what we're gonna, that's what we're going to be talking about. Okay, so there's two major presuppositions that I want to start with, okay? So go, go ahead and go to the next screen there, Sean. One is that there is a God. Now, <clears throat> they claim that over 90% of the world's population believes that there is a God. They may not believe in the God as the Christian, as the Bible God, but they believe that there is a God. That's the first one. The second one is that he has revealed himself. Now, there's lots of people believe in a God that has not revealed himself, and they're always searching. But we, as Christ followers, believe that God has revealed himself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a timeline out here, and I'm going to show you in the spectrum of the Bible how God has revealed himself. Okay, so if we draw out a timeline, and the Bible actually covers about 6,000 years of recorded history, okay? And Jesus is the central figure of recorded history. So there's about 4,000 years that we know about from the Bible before Jesus, and we're in year 2021, so there's about 2,000 years after that. But how has God revealed himself? So if you take your, your worship program there, you have <clears throat> three C's, three S's, and an R. Okay, so I'm going to go through very quickly and show you how God has revealed, revealed himself in these ways um, and, and how this progresses. Okay, so the first C there stands for creation. So you write the word creation in there. The Bible declares that God has revealed himself in creation. So if we look at Romans chapter 1, it's, uh, Paul writes there, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made or created, so that people are without excuse. Each one, every human being that's ever been in the world at any time in history is without excuse because of creation, knowing that there's a God. Now, Paul goes on to say that people suppress that knowledge. But the knowledge is there nonetheless. So the first C is creation. God reveals himself in creation. Okay, the next C is conscience. And I'm putting that close to creation here because all individuals, all human beings were created with a conscience. Now in Romans chapter 2, Paul goes on to talk about that even people who don't have a... Um, uh, a written knowledge of God that he hasn't come to them still know that there's a God because they have to explain how we know the difference between right and wrong. So even a person who's never heard of God, never heard of anything, they, they know within their conscience that internal voice that speaks to them about what is right and wrong. They know that because God has created that in every human being from the very first ones to today. So God reveals himself in that we have a conscience. And see, that's one of the things that the evolutionists or uh, people that believe in anything but God created things, they can't explain where we get our conscience from. How did that develop? Okay, so God is re reveals himself in our conscience. We know what's right and wrong. 
we can do the wrong thing enough, wrong things enough time that we um, cauterize or that's what the Bible talks about where their, their consciences are seared with a hot iron and they can't tell the difference between right and wrong. But that person has done that on their own, okay? But we all have a conscience. We know that there's right and wrong. Okay, what's the third C? The third C, that how God has revealed himself, is in his covenant community. And I'm going to abbreviate that because I'm going to need more room at the bottom. His covenant community. So up until the time of about 1450 B.C., okay, that's roughly, okay, God had been working with individual people until a point then, we've heard of Abraham, we've heard of Isaac, we've heard of uh, Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. The 12 sons become the 12 tribes of people, 12 tribes of Israel, excuse me. The 12 tribes of Israel are called to be God's covenant people for a purpose. So let, let's look at what Moses tells them. God tells Moses to tell the people this. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So we all have heard of Moses. Tim calls him Big Mo. I like that. Moses is called to take his people out of Egypt, all right, out of slavery, out of bondage, and God calls them to a covenant relationship with him, not only for them personally, but for a purpose, that is to the rest of the nations. They were to be a kingdom of priests. Well, what's a priest? A priest is the person, in the Bible now, a priest is a person who's like the in-between, who takes God's messages and shares it with the people and takes the people's needs and, sh- and, and, and instru- he, he takes those needs and shares those with God, okay? So that's what a priest, the whole nation, the whole group of Hebrews, the whole 12 tribes, the nation of Israel, the whole nation was to be a kingdom of priests, to the rest of the world. Now, what happened is they back off from that, and then the rest of the Old Testament is, is God trying to call them back to what they were called to do, okay? But God is evident because of his covenant community. Now, within that nation of Israel, most of them disobeyed. There was, a, there was a group of them, a remnant, if you will, who kept that covenant, who had a heart relationship with God and were obedient to him, okay? Um, so the, the existence of his covenant people is proof that there's a God, okay? So now the, third, the first S. The first S is Scripture. Now, Scripture is another way of saying the Bible or another way of saying the Word of God. Now, at the time that Moses took the people out of Egypt, God gave him the first five books of the Old Testament. He wrote them down, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's called the Book of the Law or the Books of Moses. Moses was to write this stuff down. He was put it, to put it in a safe place, and the people were to carry it around with them and read it continually, periodically, consistently, okay? Now, what happened through the rest of the Old Testament up to about 400 B.C. when Malachi was the last book of your Bible, all of these people, these prophets, these people that spoke for God, for God were to write down what the message was from God, and they were to put it with the, the, the books that Moses wrote, okay? That's how we got our Old Testament, it's that continual writing and collecting of God's oracles, his burdens, his, his messages to the people. Okay, they were to write that all down. That's how we got our Old Testament. Now, the, the starting of the writing of Scripture was about the time of Moses, so it would be 1450. And then the ending of our Bible, which is the New Testament, was about 100 A.D., and the New Testament was written from the time of Jesus to one, about 180 A.D. So our, our whole Bible was written in about 1,500 years, over 1,500 years, okay? So Scripture is the number uh, way that God reveals himself, okay? Now, the next S is going to be the Son. God reveals himself in the Son. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and at many times and in various ways. He's talking about all of this through here, okay? But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom all he made the universe, okay? So we got creation, conscience, covenant, community, Scripture, God reveals himself in his Son. And then Jesus comes and says, all the Old Testament was talking about me. We're going to look at that again in a little bit. Okay, so what's the, what's the third S? The third S is the Spirit. 
So now Jesus comes, and it was prophesied in the Old Testament, and Jesus promised it in John chapter 7. After Jesus is crucified, he's put in the grave, he's resurrected, and bef- after he is resurrected, he, sends the, he goes away and he sends the Holy Spirit to be inside the believers. <clears throat> this is John, through John, uh, from John 13 to 17, you can read about this. So that the promise of the Holy Spirit, which was, was promised to be given from the Old Testament, Jesus actually gives the promised Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit comes and resides in each one of us. It's God himself coming and residing in us to the point that we can be called the temple of God. Jesus said the, temp, the Spirit was with you, now he's going to be in you. And the Spirit is a guarantee of our eternal salvation. Okay? So then the last letter is the letter R, and that has to do with the return of Jesus. Ultimately, Jesus, God, will be revealed in that we, we, we will be with him personally for all of eternity. So let's read these verses. For the Lord himself, that is Jesus, will come down from heaven at the end of time with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so will we will be with the Lord forever on a new heaven and a new earth. Other parts of scripture talk about. So what's interesting about this, this spectrum of how God is revealing himself, what's interesting is, is that it starts with kind of like at a point and it starts to expand and you have all of the, of the believers through all of history who have been sealed with, with the Holy Spirit because of believing in Jesus who are gearing for the, the spectrum of who it affects broadens and the personableness or the individualness of how God is uh, uh, revealing himself gets down to where it's individual where it was with a group of people it gets to each individual believer Okay, so there's two kind of dynamics going on there. So now what I've just shared with you is what I call a personal theology. That's what we're going to be talking about this morning. So now there's two words in personal theology that scare me. One is personal, because a lot of times I don't like it when people are being personal. And of course, if they're saying something nice to me, I want to hear it over and over again, right? But if they're saying something I don't like, then that's personal. Or if they're asking me a question I don't want to answer, that's personal, all right? I, that used to work with my wife, and she says, you can't do that anymore. If I'm asking you a question, you need to give me an answer, you know, that kind of a thing. And the other word is theology. So if I took a show of hands and I said, how many of you the word theology scares you? I would say most hands would probably go up because mine went up for a long time too. But what we're going to be talking about this morning is developing a personal theology. How do we do that? Okay, how do we do that? The main way that we're going to do that for us today is through the Scriptures, that is, through the Bible, through the Word of God. That's how we're going to develop a personal theology. So here's the definition that I've come up with, which is kind of a conglomeration of a few different things. A personal theology is developing from the revelation given to us an orderly framework for understanding who God is, what He's doing, and how He's doing it. Can we know who God is? The Bible says yes. Can we know what he's doing? The Bible says yes. And how he's doing it? The Bible clearly says yes. Not everyone is a theologian who spends their life studying the Bible. Not everyone is a theologian. Some people actually get paid to do that stuff. I I, I think that'd be fascinating. Not everyone's a theologian, but everybody has a theology. We all do. Whether we've made it explicit to ourselves or not, we have a theology. Now, think of it this way. If someone studies biology, they're studying the biosphere, right? Plants, things like that. If they're studying cosmology, they're studying the universe and the knowledge of it. If they're studying etymology, it's the study of words and the knowledge of words. If it's entomology, it's the study of insects. It could go on and on and on with the ology part, okay? Theology is studying about God and having knowledge of God. So if we did a man on the street or a woman on the street kind of thing, if I stopped every one of you on the way out, and I'm not going to do that because you'd all stay, and I said, tell me what your knowledge of God is. Who is God to you? Whether you've made it explicit to yourself or not, you have a view. It might be incorrect, 
At least it's not complete. No one's theology is complete because no one can fully know God. But everyone has a theology. What God wants so much for us to have is a correct theology about who He is, what He's doing, and how He's doing it, and the part we're supposed to play. Okay? So God wants us to have a theology. Like I said, the Bible is the primary means of God's revelation to us now. So let's look at uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture, that is, all the Word of God, or all the Bible, is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. All Scripture is God-breathed. That means it's inspired of, by God. That doesn't mean that God was inspired. That means its source is God. Okay? That's what that Greek word there, theos neustos, means. That it's in, it, at its source, the Bible is the mind of God to us. And it's useful for teaching, that is, telling us what's right, for rebuking, that is, telling us what's wrong that we're doing, for correcting, that is, how to get it right, and for training, that is, how to keep it right. Now, when it says all Scripture, it's talk, at the time it was written, it was by talking about the Old Testament because that's all they had at that time, but by implication, it was also talking about the New Testament because the New Testament claims it's from God. The Old Testament and the New Testament both claim to be inspired by the Holy Spirit, given to people to write down for us to have, so that we would know how to keep things right, to do the right things, and not do the wrong things, and those kinds of things. So inspired means that its source is God. If its source is God, then it's authoritative. That is, it has authority on what it declares. And the other thing that's fascinating, as you study the Bible, you find out that the message of salvation, as it grows and as it expands and as it, as it moves through history, it's unified. It has the same message. God's mind telling us what he wants for us is, is unified through the history of what the Bible declares. So, how do we develop a personal theology when we read and study the Bible? Because that's really what God wants. What I'd like to do is use an example, the example of salvation in a very simple way, okay? Here is a big picture statement about the Bible. The Bible is God's story of our redemption in and through Jesus Christ. When you read the Bible from the beginning to the end, it is the story of redemption. And the central figure is Jesus Christ. Everything in the Old Testament looks forward to what Jesus has done. Everybody from past the new, uh, beyond the New Testament times looks back to what Jesus has done. He's the central figure of recorded history. So redemption is the big picture. Jesus is the central figure of that history. But here's one verse that talks about this. And we all know this verse. If we've watched any ball games or whatever like that, somebody will be standing there having a, a card or placard that says John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Even people that don't know where the address is in the Bible for that verse have heard that verse. Or they've seen that verse. Or they can paraphrase it in some way. So how do we understand this? If we take the big picture, big picture statement that I, had up, that I had up there, that the Bible's a story of our redemption in and through Jesus Christ, that's the big picture statement. The single verse is John 3.16. So how does this work? Understanding the big picture determines our understanding of the single verse. And understanding the single verse informs our understanding of the big picture. We find that, I find that to be true many, 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 many places in the Bible as I study and consider and read and compare where it's, it's talked about in other places, I find that to be true. That if we just have the single verse, we can accept Jesus Christ through the single verse, but then we start to look at other places in the Bible where it talks about Jesus being our redemption, and we start to develop a big picture. That is developing a personal theology. The only place we can get that, or the primary place we get that, is through the Scripture. And God wants us to be about learning more and growing in that theology. Now, does the Bible answer everything? No, it doesn't. It is, it's not a textbook. If it was, we'd, we'd, we'd be bored to read it. Any textbook I've ever had to go through in classes or whatever like that, it was just 
I didn't like to read anyway, but a textbook would be the last thing I'd want to read. But the Bible was written in, you know, over 1,500 years by 40 different authors in, in uh, several dozen types, types of genre. Most of the ones that we're familiar with would be the stories, the historical narratives. Why did God put it mostly in story form? Probably because we, he would find out that, and he knows that we can embed ourselves in those stories much easier than we can if we were reading the textbook. And as we read these stories, we find out that these people were, they had problems just like we have. And that when we read how the faithful people overcame those problems, those challenges, and how they focused their attention and their heart devotion on God, how God blessed their lives. Okay? So the Bible, here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to, the Bible presents a worldview that answers the four major questions that we ask, okay? And so that's where we look at the bottom part of your, your worship program there, okay? The four questions. Origins, meaning and purpose, morality, and destiny. Now, th there are those that are out in the philosophical community that say any worldview has to answer those four questions coherently, there's lots of worldviews out there that can't talk about or address origins because they don't know where things started. There's lots of worldviews out there that don't know about, they can't speak to destiny because as far as they're concerned, once you die, that's it. But the Bible declares to us that God has placed eternity in our hearts. We know there's something else. We know there's something else out there. What's the answer for that? Well, the Bible gives us those, those four points in a very coherent manner that we can, when we start to read the Bible, one of those four things is going to be addressed in there almost all the time. Okay? So here's what I want to do, and don't laugh when I do this. I'm not an artist, but I want to draw this out in an illustration. Okay? So this is going to be an eyeball, not a piece of pizza, as somebody said in the first gathering. I need to draw it up a little bit, too. Okay, so here's an eyeball. Does that look like an eyeball? Pizza? Okay. This is an eyelash, so we don't want... It's, it's an eyeball. Okay. And this eyeball is looking out at how we see things, how our worldview. Okay? We're looking at something. Everybody has a worldview. Now, what's a worldview? When something happens or you see something taking place or you see a situation, whatever... You are, you are taking your worldview and you're, you're interpreting what's going on based on your experiences, good or bad, your, how you were brought up, where you live in the world, everything, okay? You're, you're interpreting that situation based on who you are and how you see things and what you know, okay? That's a worldview, okay? The Bible gives us a worldview that answers those four questions, and I'm going to draw these out here, okay? So let's say... And I'm going to draw them out like in a spectrum here. So there's our four questions. Origins, meaning and purpose, morality, and destiny. Okay? So now as we're reading the Bible, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to encounter those. In, in some way, sometimes they're going to be together and all this kind of thing. Okay? So let's say, though, that we want to know what's the answer. How should we think? How should we look at the issue of the sanctity of life? And it might be a point right there. All right? And let's say on the other end of the spectrum, let's say we're considering, okay, I, need to, I know that I need to think of other people first and not be so selfish and narcissistic and all those kinds of things. So I need to li live a life of humility. What does that mean? What does it mean to live a life of humility where I'm living in balance with everybody else that's around me? And that question is out in here somewhere. And let's say I don't have, any, I don't have answers for either one of those. I don't know how to respond when somebody asks me those questions. Well, what happens is when we read our Bible, and this doesn't happen all at once, sometimes it, it happens over months and years for me, is that let's say we're studying origin or why am I here? Okay. And I start to study that, and I start to gain information and knowledge that I find to be true, okay? And I start to build that knowledge. It gets more and more. I'm building my knowledge. All of a sudden, that's going to bump into that question I want answered. The same thing with meaning and purpose. If I, as I start to study what the Bible, what God says about why I'm here and what's my meaning and purpose in life, all of a sudden, that starts to close that gap between 
this uh, uh, question and that question, and I start to develop in my mind a theology about what God feels about the sanctity of life. That's called wisdom. There's no statement in the Bible where God says, this is the sanctity of life and what it means and gives us the definition. Okay? Now, over here in humility, okay, so let's, lay, let's say I'm studying uh, morality. This, how do we live with one another? Okay, ethics and morality. And the Bible speaks to this, and I start to learn how God wants me to live with the people that are around me and, and all those kinds of things. And, and uh, I start to grow in that knowledge to eventually, it'll start to bump up with that question of humility. What does it mean to be, live a uh, humble life, to live in humility? What does that mean? Okay. And I might be talking about, or uh, studying about how things are going to, how God's going to wrap things up, how he's going to button it down and all this. And I'm learning all this information, and all of a sudden, that starts to grow, and my, and my understanding starts to grow, and that bumps into this idea of how living in humility has not only benefit for now, but for eternity. Okay? So that's how that works there. So what I want you to do is, let's go back to Let's go back to Jesus as the central figure of all of history, okay? So if you take out your, your thing, the origins, the question that we're asking there is, where did we come from? Why are, you know, the meaning and purpose is, uh, what gives us significance and value, and what, what does God want us to do, okay? And we're talking about um, the morality part. How are we supposed to live? And when we talk about destiny, where's this all headed? What's the purpose for everything we're doing? Does it mean something at the end or at the end why we're doing what we're doing? Okay, so let's look at it and focus as Jesus is the central figure. When we look at origins, we find out that Jesus was the agent of creation. Jesus was the agent of creation. It says that in Hebrews chapter 1. We looked at that. It declares that in John chapter 1. It also declares that in Colossians chapter 1. So when we start to look at why we're here and we start to look at who Jesus is and why he came, that answer starts to come to our understanding. Okay? Jesus as creator. So let's go to the second question. What gives us meaning and purpose? The fact that God came in a man to redeem us. We have significance and value that he did that for each and every one of us. So Jesus as Redeemer. When we go to the third question about morality, Jesus is the model for our lives. He sets the example of how we're to live in devotion to God and loving other people. How about destiny? Jesus is the fulfillment of of everything that we hope for. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that we hope for, and that opens up into the eternal part of our understanding, what God has planned for us. We do know this, that in 1 John it says, we do, know not, we do not know exactly what we will be, but we do know that when he appears, we will see him as he is, for we will be like him. So whatever body, glorified body that Jesus was resurrected in, we are going to have the same kind of body that he had, fit for sacred space for all of eternity and a new heaven and a new earth. So let's think about something. Did Jesus promote that each one of us have a personal theology? Was Was it important to Jesus that each of us individually know who he is and have a theology about what God is doing, how he's doing it. Let's look at what Jesus says. Now, Jesus is crucified. This is a scripture passage that happens after he's resurrected. He's on the earth for 40 days before he ascends. On his very first day of his resurrection, before he even had met with his disciples, okay, two of the disciples were walking along the road to Emmaus. It's in Luke chapter 24. And they're walking along discussing what had happened in the last few days because, see, they had put all their hopes in Jesus who was going to rescue them from Roman oppression. He was going to throw the yoke of the Roman oppression off and and Israel was going to be back in its glory days, but they didn't understand the full impact of what Jesus came for. Okay, So they're walking along and discussing all this. They're depressed. They're downtrodden, all this kind of thing. He shows up walking along the path with them. They didn't recognize him because he kind of veiled who he was with them. And so he's asking them, well, what's going on today? 
Why are you so depressed? What was interesting is he's the only one that knew what was going on. They explained to him all the things that they had hopes in this person, but he ends up, he's dead and he's in a grave. And here's what he says. He starts to talk to them with the beginning with Moses and all the prophets. He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now, did he look at every single verse? No, but he looked at the stories that were in the Old Testament, the emphasis that was in the Old Testament, the types, the shadows, all the things, the prophecies. He talked a lot about what was going on and said all those things talked about him. Now, after they had shared a meal with him and Jesus disappeared from their sight, they were sitting together, and this is how they they respond. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? What God wants to do is when we're studying His Scripture by ourselves, in our car, in our basement, wherever we are, we're reading the Scriptures and we're asking for insight and understanding. He wants us to give that. He wants so much to give us that understanding, but we have to open it and read it. We have to put the work into wanting to know. Now, for me, my understanding doesn't come right away. Sometimes it takes weeks and months and years before all of a sudden, maybe I read something here and I read something out of there and I read something in that part of history and I'm reading something in the New Testament and I'm experiencing something here and I'm like, I'm not getting any answers. And all of a sudden, it's like I'm driving around doing my job or whatever and it's like all of a sudden, the Spirit leads me into an understanding of how to connect these dots. And I'm just overwhelmed because it's like it's not something I could have figured out on my own. My heart burns when that, something like that happens, similar to those two on the road to Emmaus when Jesus was explaining the Scriptures to them. I wish I had a book that says, the book that says Jesus explained all the Scriptures to them. Because there's lots of them I don't understand yet. Lots of them. Okay? Now, later on that evening, he's with the disciples, and he said to them, this is what I told you, told you, whoa, told you, while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Gets this. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. Oh, God, open my mind. Now, notice he says, law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That's, that is a phrase talking about the whole Old Testament. Okay? Jesus opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures, but they had to know the Scriptures before they could understand them. So there's a faith aspect to this. God wants us to have a personal theology, but it's also purposeful. Okay, so Jim, a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, when we were were preparing uh, some different things we were talking about, he said, Tony, what, what is your burning bush experience? Now, some of you have heard that phrase, right? The burning bush You've been to your burning bush or whatever. Well, that comes from back here with Moses, Big Mo, as Tim calls him, where uh, Moses is in uh, uh, Egypt, and he he kills an Egyptian taskmaster because he's hurting one of his fellow Hebrew people, and he has to flee to Midian. He's there for 40 years. God comes to him in a burning bush. Okay, if you've ever watched the Ten Commandments, uh, Charlton Heston will always look like Moses to me. But anyway, there's this burning bush. Moses turns aside to this burning bush, and it's God speaking to him from the burning bush. And what he does, he says, Moses, I'm going to lead you back to take the people out of Egypt. Of course, you have the the situation where Moses says, I can't do it, I can't talk, and all this kind of... But anyway, he does this, and he leads them to the promised land. Moses had a burning bush. Well, several years ago, I had a burning bush, because I would dearly love to sit in my basement every morning and study God's Word and come to these heartburn situation, not a heartburn, a burning heart situation. It didn't sound good with a heartburn, did it? Where my heart burns because of what I've understood in God's Word. Because, see, the Bible is so simple that a child can understand what he's reading, but it's so deep that a theologian, someone who studies the Bible, can, can spend years doing this. It's amazing. Well, anyway, my burning bush was about maybe 15, 20 years ago where God impressed upon my heart very, very clearly that, yes, I've given you this and you should rejoice, but it's not just for you. So now I have to start sharing it. So that's kind of like my burning bush thing. Now, don't be afraid. 
Don't be afraid that God's going to give you a burning bush and you'll have to come up here and give a message on a Sunday morning because not everybody's called to that. Sometimes I wonder if I'm called to that. But you're going to be responsible for sharing that with someone else, a family member, a child, a a person who, who you work with who has a burning question that they have to have answered. Okay? God wants us to have an abundant life. So in in John chapter 10, Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full, that you may thrive. If I could use the other word. Okay? Next verse, Sean. His divine power, that is God's power, has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. This verse says that God has given us everything for life and godliness. Okay? Next verse. For physical training is of some value. Remember I was talking about doing exercises? But godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Do we understand that our developing a personal theology, that is knowing who God is, what He's doing, how He's doing it, and living our lives in accordance with those truths has impact on how we're going to experience eternity? Not that we will or will not experience. If you, are, if you believe in Jesus or a Christ follower, you will experience life, eternal life in eternity with the Father. But we're not all going to experience it the same way. So we need to be about finding out what, where we came from, what, gives, what, what does God have for us as far as our meaning and our purpose of our lives individually and how we're to live with other people and what his promises are for us? So now at the end of every message, Tim, Tim gives us a challenge, and I have a challenge too, but it's kind of a different challenge. It's a challenge for you to challenge people like me. Not because I think I know everything, because I don't know everything. I would like to know everything. And here's the challenge. Wherever you are on that spectrum, whether you were invited this morning and you didn't want to come, to the person that you're, you're just, you're just, you're in diving and you're doing the breaststroke in the Word of God, if I could use that metaphor, all right? You're in it, all right? Wherever you are on that, what is your burning question that you want to know about God, about the Christian life, and about where things are headed? What is that burning question? I'm challenging you to challenge me and people like me who, who want to teach the leadership team, your mentor, whoever it is, somebody on, you know, the, the theologian. What is that burning question that will get you out of neutral and moving forward in your Christian life? I'm not saying I have an answer. I may not have an answer. If I don't have an answer, I would tell you I don't have an answer. But those of you that have been part of my growth classes know I love questions, and I can chase rabbits for a long time. Okay, what is that burning question, believer or not? Because I have found in my tours around the world, or in my world, that there's lots of people who don't know about God who have burning questions that that really desperately want them answered. There may not be an answer that we can find, but let's walk together to see if there is one that God wants to allow us to have. I realize I'm probably putting Tim on the spot and Jim on the spot and Nikki on the spot and Dom on the spot and whoever else you may deal with. But Ephesians 4 says that Christ gave gift to the church and part of those gifts are the gifted people, pastors, evangelists, pastors, teachers, I missed them, apostles, prophets, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That means to make us competent in our Christian walk. So challenge us. We'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. So the challenge this morning is I'm challenging you to challenge us so we can move forward together. Because there is a principle of understanding and it's found in Matthew chapter 13, verse 12. I want you to write that down. I don't have a screen for it. It's Matthew chapter 13, verse 12. It's both a promise and a warning. It goes like this. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And he will have abundance. There's that word to idea of thriving again. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. See, Jesus is teaching in parables in this context. And he says, your desire to understand will be rewarded. 
Do what I ask you and I'll give you more, God says, like in Joshua chapter 1. Do what I ask you and I'll give you more. But if you don't pursue understanding, you'll slide away the other way. And what you understand, you'll lose. It's like what you don't use, you lose. Same with the muscle, right? So that goes along with the challenge. We're either moving towards understanding or we're losing understanding. There's no middle ground. There's no static. There's no, I'm going to wait five years before I do anything. The Bible, doesn't under, the Bible does not present an opportunity for us to wait on our Christian walk. Jesus says, you're either for me or you're against me. So, we can't grow past what we do not know. And ultimately, we'll live what we believe. God has created us for great things, to have dominion and stewardship over the rest of his creation. That's what Adam and Eve were told to do. And they sinned and they lost it. And God's plan of salvation is to get us all back to dominion and stewardship. And Jesus was sent to live as a man, fully as a man, to show us what dominion and stewardship is. We need to live to that end. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are a great and a loving God. You've created us in your image and your likeness. We are to represent you to each other and to the rest of creation. Lord, help us to have a desire. Place in us a desire to know more about who you are, what you're doing, and how you're doing it. And help us to just sit down and read. Lord, we ask for insight. We ask for understanding. We ask for you to manifest yourself in the pages of Scripture because when we open your word, Jesus is present. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.